Good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight we're going to be working on Chapter 1 in our book. And one of the things that we've done prior to the start of class here tonight is I had a little workshop uh, for people interested in installing uh, Visual Studio. If you have a copy of the textbook, and the, the textbook um, is a, actually a Microsoft training manual. I'm going to bring it over to my screen here from my second screen. Um, and this is what it looks like. And if you, like, scroll down and you... Uh, start reading through the introduction parts of this book, you will realize that this book has a very specific purpose. And that is to train people who are already professionals in the field. And I want you to think about this, this wording here. People typically with three to five years experience to prepare them for taking an MCP level certification exam. MCP stands for Microsoft Certified Professional. And there's the actual exam number, I want to say, is like 70-486 or something like that. And it is to, to test for HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript. Not on a rudimentary level, though. We're looking at a professional level certification that's very challenging. In fact, the first time I walked in to take it, um, I was very uh, overconfident. I, you know, I've been working in this field forever, I teach this stuff, I know it backwards and forward, I'm not going to study, I'm just going to go in and take the exam. And guess what? I did not pass. I, I missed it by, by two questions. You know, and, and that's the thing. This material can be quite challenging at times. I don't want that to freak you out, though. But the, the book is intended for a professional level of programmer. And there's a lot to learn here. And, and really, the important thing is, not that you're preparing for the certification, but that you're learning all the advanced techniques that came with this new technology when it was released. This was released about five years ago, and the book is a little bit dated. So we have some version issues between Visual Studio that's available now and Visual Studio that uh, was available then. At that time, Visual Studio came in many different flavors. One of the flavors was Visual Studio Express for Web. It was designed for web designers and for basic Windows programming. That product is now not even available through Microsoft Imagine or what we used to call DreamSpark, which we discovered last week. Uh, or was it Friday? I think it was Friday night we discovered that. Um, that's not even out there anymore. You can go to Microsoft and download it, though, if you really are hell-bent on using the exact same version that's in the book. So if you don't install Visual Studio 2012, which version should you download? And really the answer to that is you should download what, I, what is the, the most current version. I do have a link in the resources section of our course shell. And right up here at the top, it says Visual Studio 2017 Community. And I know that all of you here in class or most of you have already installed this product or, or are planning to. But this is the page you want to come to. You want to install the community version, which is on the far left. It is, in essence, the same as the professional version, minus a couple of small tools. But it's basically the full-featured version of the product for free. Yes, you can go to DreamSpark or uh, Microsoft Imagine, download a license key, and install either professional or enterprise. That's up to you. I don't see the reason for that when they give you the whole full-blown tool for free. So make that choice on your own. But that's the version that I'm going to be using here in class. The videos that I have pre-recorded for this course show, and some of you have already dug into them, you'll notice that they were done probably with either Visual Studio 2013 or 2012 or a combination thereof. And once we get past these initial chapters where we learn that the interfaces are different, the project selections are different, the menus look slightly different, once we get past those hurdles, the concepts are all the same. So that's why we're recording this video partially, is to make sure that people are all on the same page. If you've gone through the process of installing Visual Studio, uh, and I have, and actually I had like pre-created a project here, which I'm now going to, to close just to demonstrate, you'll launch Visual Studio. It'll come up on the screen like this. And I'm a big fan of just immediately bypassing the start screen unless the project I want to work on is already listed here. That's not always the case. And it's certainly not going to be the case in the first chapter of the book. 
if you find that some of the things that are, are missing from Visual Studio that we're going to be putting up on our screen here, we discovered before class started that if you click on your start menu and type Visual Studio Installer, you can click on that scroll. It'll bring up the installer for the product that will help you choose the right components and add them in. Now I'm letting this come up on screen on purpose so that we can learn what is installed and what is not. So I'm clicking on the modify button right now and what that's going to do, if I remember right, is it's going to bring up a list on the side that shows what components are installed and also from a visual standpoint which of the boxes you should check. I'm going to just very quickly talk about each one of these, which ones you actually need and which ones you might want to consider adding. And it will depend on what program you're in. I'm assuming that everybody in this room is either in the web software developer program, the web developer program, or the SharePoint developer program. If you're not in one of those, then your choices might even be uh, a little more different than that. But at the very least, you want to make sure that these boxes are checked. So take a look either at the list the summary list on the side or the boxes that I have checked. And I can't show them all at once, so I'm going to leave the top half of the screen up first. So you can see we have .NET desktop development that lets us do our regular programming. And, and really these, these top two are really important because they include all the tools for C Sharp, Visual Basic, JavaScript, and a couple of other languages. And they allow you to create Windows applications inside of a Windows environment. That's what these tools do. We do want to make sure that in the web and cloud section that ASP.NET is checked. Now even though this is not an ASP.NET class, this approach to authoring web pages really does fit into the .NET category. Largely because we're using Visual Studio. We don't really learn ASP.NET until you take the ASP.NET course and I do have several people that are in this room that are either in the online section or the face-to-face -face section of .NET, which happens on Fridays. Um, you don't need the Azure development unless you plan on taking the SharePoint courses. And you could wait until then to install these tools. Node.js, I will say this one is optional. Yes, we will play with Node.js in this class, but part of the process of doing the exercise is actually installing the tool. So you could be preemptive and install it now, or you could wait until then. That's your choice, but we will eventually be adding it. I added the data storage and processing and the Office and SharePoint development tools because the data and storage and processing gives us access to databases. So if we had SQL Server running on our laptop or wanted to connect to a remote SQL Server, we could do it. Uh, in addition, when we use the Office and SharePoint development tools. It gives us certain templates that would allow us to develop higher end applications both in ASP.NET 2 and in SharePoint. If you scroll down, you'll see that the only other thing that I have checked is the .NET Core cross-platform development. And that I frankly added because it has some exciting new tools that I'm interested in exploring. More, more than the fact that I actually need them. All right, so take that with a grain of salt. So I, I'm exploring those for, you know, future development concerns. If you see anything else here that you think is interesting to install, or as I posed the question to many of the people here, if maybe as one of your electives you consider taking the C++ course uh, with, with Alan Pearson, you might want to throw in the C++ tools. But frankly, I would wait until you take the class because anything that you add here is going to take up hard drive space. I think, um, Cindy Lou, when, when you chose all of the options that I chose, I think your total installed size was a little over 20 gigabytes. So before you proceed, you want to make sure you have an absolute minimum, I'd say of like 30 gigabytes free before you start walking this path. What's with the 10 extra gigabytes? Well, when you're installing stuff, things are downloaded, decompressed and shuffled around on your hard drive, you, you want to have enough space so that stuff can, can, can float around and move. All right. So if you've 
got that in place and you've done the install, and if you haven't done the install, you can go ahead and initiate the process. Um, I think that we've had people do it in about a half hour here on campus, and that's with the super high speed uh, internet connection. We have a, a, a gigabit pipe that comes to campus. Not that we get all of that, but certainly it'll be faster than most of your home networks. Um, if you're on a home network where you're under 100 megabits, you're probably looking at more like an hour for download and install. That's kind of average. If you have an older machine and you have real slow internet, or if you're at the coffee shop downloading it, you might have to buy a couple extra lattes because you might be there for a couple of hours and just prepare for that. All right, so now that we're past that point and uh, looking at the installer here, I'm closing the installer and I'm in to the product. But now I'm going to shift myself over to the textbook, and yes, I'm going to get luxury. You guys ready? All right, so I'm, I'm going to be bringing up the PDF version of the book here up on screen, and I am going to be scrolling through it uh, and help helping to guide you. And I'm going to focus on a few different things and kind of gloss over some others. Uh, so please follow along as best you can. Now, when Visual Studio came out way back then, they had a bunch of different versions. And you can see now that they've kind of wa watered those down to a smaller selection. They really have three basic versions. One really exciting thing, if you are a Mac user, Visual Studio is now available for the Macintosh. I have not loaded on, on my Macintosh yet. I have a couple of Macs at home. Um, however, I was talking with Christian uh, just a couple days ago, and he managed to install SQL Server and Visual Studio both on his Mac, and he said they run beautifully. So I'm really kind of enthused to try this because the implication here in the past would be that if you had a Mac, we'd be like, well, either you're running a VM of some sort, a virtual machine, uh, or you're logging into our VDI or, uh, you know, go buy a PC. You know, none of those are really appealing options. But now that you could run the stuff natively right inside the operating system and do the same work, that's really exciting for me. I, and that, that really kind of shows that we're moving into a, more of a truly multi-platform era, which is a great thing for all of you. It means that you can do a lot of this work on, on any machine. My understanding is it also runs on Linux. Um, so it, it's exciting. Well, you know the information now. <laughs> so, all right. So the basic versions that they do offer now, we saw from the website with the community, which is the same as the professional, basically. Just it misses a couple of the team tools that are built in. Uh, but then there's also uh, the enterprise version. And chances are, if you worked in a commercial environment where you're using this as a day-to-day -day tool, you would pay for the product, and your organization would license it. It's not cheap, folks. I don't know what the license fees are these days, but in the past, you'd buy Visual Studio, and it was an investment. And you'd be looking at usually about $1,000, uh, roughly, to get the enterprise version. That, that's, that makes most people like step back and go, wow. right? So we really are in a different era. So Microsoft isn't trying to make their money off of Visual Studio anymore, um, at least from you know, people learning it. And, and it's a smart move on their part, because so many other languages all the tools are free, and that encourages people to use them and learn them, and really keeps the technology healthy, right? So Microsoft, I think, is doing this because I think they see the writing on the wall that the future does not necessarily belong to Windows. Windows is really the oddball operating system, folks. Macintosh runs on top of Unix, and just about every other operating system is a variant of Unix and Linux. Our phones whether it's Apple, you know, whatever. So I think they're, they're being very smart. All right. And we don't have to worry about all those different versions anymore. Um, ever since this version of Visual Studio, HTML5 has been supported. It is important to note that HTML5 became a standard right around the same time I started working here at Gateway, which was right at the beginning of 2014. Up until that point, it had existed, but it was not an official standard for the web, for coding. A lot of browsers were supporting it all the way back, you know, at like 2009, 2008, Google Chrome was supporting HTML5 features. Um, why that's important 
HTML5, which you should have learned in your Web 1 class, has a lot of significant improvements over previous versions that allow for future functionality and really compatibility with all the modern types of devices that we're using. There's also some capabilities that we're going to explore that you might not even realize were there or you talked about them so briefly in your Web 1 class, you know, where you're, you're learning the basics, you're not really worrying about drag and drop, for example, or geolocation or internal storage, those types of things. The tools that are built in, uh, especially those uh, for JavaScript, and one of the reasons why we use Visual Studio to teach this class is because the JavaScript debugger that's built into Visual Studio is excellent. So you get the same kind of debugging support that you would get in writing like a standard programming language. On the fly debugging, so if you like mistype a variable name or you put in a wrong function name or you forget your semicolon, it's underlining, highlighting, and giving you a message right away that something is wrong. And in many cases, you can even hover over it, right click and fix it. All right, so those that learn how to code with like Notepad++ or brackets or something like that, you're going to go, that's cheating. No, it's not cheating. That's utilizing the tools that all the professionals use too because the, the thing is when you get out into the workplace and you start doing this professionally, you you gotta you gotta be productive. You can't take you know a week to, to build a website. You gotta do it like in a day or two. So how are you gonna do that with every possible shortcut you can get in your arsenal? And it's not cheating, it's using the tool that's available. Right? Otherwise we'd all still be driving manual transmission in our cars, right? Well some of us prefer that, right? And some people prefer coding by hand without a debugger. That's fine, but if you can catch a mistake as you're typing it, that's that's the thing. So the JavaScript and all the, uh, the debugging tools that are built in are, are excellent. There is no more Visual Studio Express. Okay, So we're not going to worry about this product. We're also not going to worry about Visual Studio Blend. I've had plenty of emails about both of these things. It's good to be familiarized with what they are, but the Express version was basically the free version of Visual Studio. That's all they would give you. They'd give you Visual Basic, they'd give you C Sharp, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and good luck with the rest. That was kind of their approach. You want the other tools, you got to pay. Right? It was enough to get people programming, but not really enough to do heavy hitting work uh, that professionals do. So, all right. One of the things that we're going to get into when we get to the exercises, the templates that you select, the menu options that you choose, which has had a lot of us stuck and I've had plenty of emails about these. So once you have all those right components installed, the ones that we selected from the, from the installation windows, we'll learn the steps for doing things differently than what the book shows. So the book's going to show you one thing because that's what worked in 2012, and now we're going to learn the 2017 way to do it. And once you learn it, it's no big deal from there on in, and the rest of the book will flow pretty quickly. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get us down to um, a couple of different project types. And what I'm going to do is I'm just get right to the exercise, and my scrolling is being a little bit weird here. So they have a, the section on Blend. Uh, one, one thing I'm going to say about Blend really quick, Blend was kind of an attempt for the Microsoft people to come up with a tool that was designed for creating strictly Windows Store applications. So if you guys aren't familiar with the Windows Store, they try to do kind of like the App Store like you know Apple did, right? Or the Google Play Store where you can go and download apps and they just figured, hey, Windows 8 came out, we can create these apps and you can go here and you can download them. And a lot of the apps that you see here, which are designed for the most part to run full screen, were authored in the old days with Blend. And these days you can do it with Visual Studio and that's why I skip over that section. All right, so I'm going to be jumping down to uh, the exercises at this point. All right, so step one, you guys ready? I'm doing your homework for you and I'm recording it. So 
There's no excuse for not doing it. All right, so it says the first step here, install Visual Studio. Make that 2017. Which version are we installing? 2017 community, professional, or enterprise, I suggest community. With all little options. All right, so the, the next step says start Visual Studio. Okay, I already did that. Click File, choose New Project. That's what we're doing. So I'm going to go to File, New Project. If you happen to have the start screen on your in your display, which is default for Visual Studio. You can click the little X and close it or just leave it there. It will go away. All right. So once you're in there, um, you might not come up to the same screen that I have right now. But notice that if you installed everything correctly, you should be able to expand the installed section on the left-hand sidebar go down to JavaScript if you want to narrow down the selection choose Windows Universal and we are going to create a blank app notice on the far right side there it says JavaScript that's the core language and it's kind of weird right so it's like why isn't it HTML I guess I'm asking this not erroneously why isn't why doesn't it say HTML? You're you're on the right track. Your 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 head's in the right direction, and and that is basically because HTML and CSS really don't do anything. Well, they do, but <laughs> they display content. JavaScript does stuff. Now, the interesting thing about working with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and this is something I, I want you guys to try to internalize, these are what we call client-side technologies, meaning I do not need a server to make them operate. All I need is the files. If I have my HTML files, my CSS files, and my JavaScript, but it could be a phone, it could be a game system, laptop, desktop, doesn't matter. It does not require a server or an internet connection. All you need is the files. But an interesting thing has happened with JavaScript, folks, over the past decade or so. JavaScript is kind of graduating from being strictly a client-side language to being a server-side language also. When we saw that little Node.js component that we were installing, that is server-side JavaScript. Hmm. We'll talk about that more when we get to that. Even more interestingly, did you guys know that all the major operating systems, Windows, Linux, and, and the Mac OS, all have, within the operating system themselves, a JavaScript runtime library. So in other words, the operating system itself supports JavaScript. Why? Because applications are beginning to be written in JavaScript because of the popularity of the language with the people who are learning how to program. It's one of the easiest languages to learn. And arguably, you know, maybe the, one of the most popular. It, and that's not a process that's changing. So that that's why we see this listed as JavaScript. All right. Now, they have very specific instructions for us, and I guess we should probably follow them. And they want us to name the application. So I'm just copy-pasting right from my PDF. Yes, it's cheating a little bit. So I'm going to paste that into the name. And then they want us to name the solution something else. I'm just going to give you a disclaimer right now. They follow this pattern all the way through the book. Truth be told, I don't care what you name the stuff as long as you know what it is and where you put it. I think it's kind of helpful that if you're doing like chapter 5 work that you don't name it chapter 4. I mean, that's just, that's just me. Um, <laughs> All right, so I, I try to make it funny, but I'm not a professional comedian, obviously. I'll leave that to Dave Chappelle, okay? <laughs> um, and then they'll also have very specific instructions here about select the location for your application, so find the spot to put it, 
and they also have a thing here be sure to keep the create directory for solution box checked all right so there's a little box here and ours reads a little different it says create directory for solution right let me explain what this does when you work with Visual Studio it will create a folder named the same thing as your as what you're naming your project inside that folder it will create another folder named the same thing as your project got that so a folder inside of a folder and then in between those two, so inside the root folder, it puts in a file with the SLN extension, which is our solution file. When you're building things inside of Visual Studio, that solution file is basically a collection of pointers to assets within the project. It also allows you to take a number of projects and group them together into one large application. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but many applications really are collections of applications bunch of programs working together. Putting them all as part of one solution is a convenient way to organize them. With that solution file, it keeps track of all the assets, knows where everything's located, even if you don't. So follow what the book is suggesting. I wouldn't say that this is a necessary step in every circumstance, but for right now, we're doing what they're saying. If you, I would put it somewhere where you could find it. <laughs> does it matter? The question was, does it matter? Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to work. No, that that's a really that's a great question. Oh yeah, you know that that's a, that's a pretty valid point. You have to watch that because yeah. if you need, if you use really long and verbose names, you can run Windows does actually have a limitation as to the length of file and folder names. <laughs> Now, if you guys are watching what I'm doing up on screen here, and I had a little speech to everybody here before, like where you save your files, don't use flash drives, right? Don't use just local storage, use some sort of cloud storage. And I have the Google Drive software installed in my system tray down here, so it creates a Google Drive folder. And then I have a folder for this class. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new folder for this semester. So I'm just going to say 2018 spring. I know what that means for me. And I'm just going to save all my work in there. Yep, and this will automatically sync to my Google Drive. So I'm going to select this folder. And so this project is now going to end up inside that folder, and I'm going to go ahead and say OK. OK, you want me not to click yet? Yes. I'm not clicking. I'm anti-clicking. <laughs> That's kind of like a right click, but a wrong click, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm just looking for clarification. OK. Yes, different project templates. All I can say, Richard, is the one that I chose is the right one. <laughs> now, chances are, and, and this is the thing that's kind of maddening about these things, right? They all have different intents. If I actually look at the description for that, you notice there is one difference. It says universal Windows APIs. So any of the application programming interfaces that are built into Windows are accessible through this template where through this one I think it it's different I couldn't tell you exactly what those were unless I was working on a project that specifically required them but for right now we're looking at real basics and most of the work that we would do would probably work in either one of those just fine because it's simplistic when would I use a Windows API when I'm trying to interface with something very specific within the file system. So for example, if I was writing an application that needed the print API, 
So if I needed to interface with the printer, I would utilize that tool. And then I would have a completely different set of libraries available to pull from. We're going to be authoring for the web. That's our goal here. All right, I'm going to say OK. Now we'll come up to a secondary window. We had a little talk about this before as well. And this is really a byproduct of the fact that we can use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to actually create Windows applications. Not web pages, but applications that run inside of Windows as regular native operating system applications. If I was really concerned about that, I would then very carefully select from this list because I wouldn't necessarily want to write an application that only works in Windows 10. I might downgrade that a little bit. But I'm not really concerned right now because I know I'm, I'm shooting for the web, not for Windows. So I'm just going to say OK because really it doesn't matter to me. Now once that process is complete, I hit that button. And what it automatically does is if you look off on the right hand side, Visual Studio has somewhat of a complex interface to begin with, especially if you've never used it before. But in Visual Studio, we have a little area called the Solution Explorer. And if you guys have coded in Java before or if you've coded in some other tools, very often they'll give you some sort of a tool that allows you to explore the package of files that's associated with the project. Some of these things will actually be files and some of them will be assets that will get built into the project if compiled. We're not building a compiled application here. We are building web pages. So not really a lot of concern. Um, but notice what it does. It kind of automatically gives us best practices, right? Best practice if you're a web designer is to create separate folders for your assets. Assets include images. So you see an images folder, the JavaScript folder, and a CSS folder. Yes, go ahead, expand these, and take a look inside. Hold on, hold on a second, I didn't put any of that stuff in there. That's what you should be saying, right? I hit a button and it created all this stuff. Look, there's images, there's CSS, there's JavaScript. You want to take a look at them? You know how you do that in Visual Studio? Just go ahead and click on one of the files. So I'm going to take a look at the CSS file. Well, not much in there, right? But the template is there. It also shows you Microsoft's conventions for naming the files. Isn't that interesting? Right? It's not styles.css. Their, their thing is default. All right. Look at some of the images if you want. Take a look at the JavaScript file. Once again, there's no code inside here. Notice also in the root, there is an index.html file. Let's click on that. And you don't have to double click. Single click will actually bring it into the window. And then notice they have the basis of a well-formed HTML5 document. The doc type for HTML5, right, is just very simply doc type.html. Is that line required? Let's talk about that. The doc type. It actually is not required. It's only required if you want to follow the rule sets and then have the browsers render it the way that you want. Otherwise, if you don't care, you, you can actually omit that. But it should be there in, as, as a matter of good practice. If you ran a validator against it, it would scream at you that you don't have a doc type. Browsers always want a doc type so they know what rules they're following. And they will render your page according to those rules. And HTML5 has very specific rules. All right, we have to have the HTML tags opening and closing and encapsulating the whole document. Have to have a head section. Have to have a body section. Really, everything that you see on the screen there, I would say with the exception of the style sheet link and this stuff here, really does not have to be there. But chances are you'll throw some of those things in. We will see that as we go. Any questions so far? All right. Let's do something even more fun. Uh, let's follow the next steps. <laughs> We're like 20 minutes on step six. I mean, actually, we created a new project.
And they, basically what they're doing is the same thing that we just did, is they looked at the, the JavaScript file, they looked at the HTML file. Notice that in the older version, it created a default HTML, right? You know why? Because that's what Microsoft's convention was. They were like, we're making our own rules. Default HTML. You know, we're not doing index HTML. Isn't that weird? Those of you in the ASP.NET class, guess, guess what? Default ASPX is going to be the format that we're using. So, that because that's what that's what the tool creates. All right, but it's good to know um, and to note those things. All right. Okay. Cindy Lou is going to give you the answer for that. What, what's my standard answer? Just, just what's my standard answer? It depends is the answer. So the question for those of you listening to the recording is um, if it automatically defaulted to default HTML as opposed to index.html and I upload it via FTP to my web server and then I follow my URL excluding default.html from the address line would it automatically load? And the answer is it depends. It depends on how the server is configured. Most modern web servers look for default HTML as one of the standards, with index.html actually sitting higher in priority. However, when you create an ASP.NET application using Microsoft technology, and it runs, they run differently than regular HTML applications, um, there's a little snippet of code that tells it which what page is the start page? It is irrelevant what the file name is. So that, that's, that's interesting, though. Because some servers will load default automatically and some won't. It's just all in the configuration. Most of the modern ones will load it automatically, though. It's an ex that's an excellent question. Y yes, that, that is correct. Um, so the question that you're not hearing, folks, is we're looking at the names of the files that were created. So in the book, they're talking about default.js. That's obviously changed. Um, here they have index.html. They're calling it default.html. It's really, you know, apples and oranges. It's still, it's still basically the same things. These are differences in the versions of Visual Studio. If you're driving yourself crazy going, oh my god, it's not working the same, you know, Hopefully I'm alleviating a little bit of that because <laughs> I know I do get that. So, all right. Now what they're going to ask us to do is they are going to ask us to, to launch this, right? And if you uh, take a look up here, if we hit the play button, and, and the play button, this is kind of interesting because what happens um, with this application um, is we have this play button at the very top in the toolbar and it really in most uh, integrated development environments, most IDEs like this, that's the debug button, right? So it tries to launch the application, goes through the code, looks for errors. If there's anything that would halt it, it would stop you and have, ask you to fix it. Otherwise, it attempts to launch it in whatever mode it deems appropriate. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to hit play. And I'm, I'm noticing it doesn't list the browser here. So what's going to happen when I hit play? This is kind of interesting. No, actually what, what's happened here, folks, and you saw two things, right? Visual Studio is running. And when it's running, it goes into a different mode. It actually goes into a mode where you can kind of monitor what's going on in the background with the application. But the app, application actually did not launch in a browser. You guys noticing this? It launched in a window. This is exactly what I'm talking about. It's becoming so prevalent now. And it should also start tripping something in your brain. I'm, at least I'm hoping that if you ever thought of like maybe creating content for an operating system as opposed to just a browser, 
you can do it with these tools using the same technologies. So you can write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and create a Windows application that runs inside of a window. Not only that, but if you probably go to your start menu somewhere here, it may have actually even added a, a start menu item for it. Actually, right there. You noticing that? Like, wow. Now, now you feel empowered, right? It's even better than a web browser. <laughs> All right. So if you check at what's going on in the book, and <clears throat> what happens in the book when they launch it? Does it open up in a browser? Hmm. Yeah, it says it does. That's kind of interesting. So one of the things we're going to learn is like these differences between the templates. What's happened here is absolutely fine. We did nothing wrong. We followed the instructions. This is just what the template does now. Interestingly, if you jump back over to Visual Studio and hit the stop button up here, that will kill the application in the background and take you out of debugging mode. You should also be able to come to the um, the index file here. Choose open with and actually find a browser, even though this not it's not giving us that here in the list. So the question becomes is how do I look at this stuff as a web page, right? And that's that's what's going to come up next. And to do that we are going to need to use a different type of template. You guys ready for that? Okay. So really, this actually completes the first exercise. Even if it doesn't match up with what's in the book, I would call this a completed chapter one. Let's go ahead, though, and try a different approach. I'm going to go up to my file menu now, and I'm going to choose Close Solution. And what that does is it closes all the files. If I just came up here and just closed, let's say, my index file, that's it. It just closes that file. Everything else is still open. When I go up, go up to the file menu and choose Close Solution, it closes everything in the Solution Ex Explorer altogether. All right, so let's experiment a little bit. And I want you guys now to go up to the file menu and choose new project. And this time I, I want to switch to a, a different type of project. So hmm, if I want to build a website, how would I do that? Any clues? Anybody done this already? Yeah, they. Right. Right. And they're using Visual Basic as a back end. I, now, I'm going to tell you that we've switched, and Microsoft has too, to C Sharp as a back end language, as, as a primary. Um, so, what I would like you to do is go to the installed templates, Visual C Sharp, Web and then website. And then notice that they have a, a number of different selections. We're going to choose the empty website at the top. And I'm not going to even bother to name it right now. I'm just going with the default. Um, I'm just going to click OK and let it create what it creates. And then I just want to do a little bit of a comparison between what we just did with JavaScript and what we're doing with the ASP.NET. Now, the interesting thing is here, some of you are in the, the .NET class too, so you're going to see this stuff again, and that's this is mostly the world we're going to be working in. But notice it creates like really a couple of basic files, but really a whole lot of nothing because it expects you to build it all from scratch, right? So if I went ahead and expanded these folders, I don't see anything in here that looks familiar to me. I don't see a HTML or a JavaScript or uh, images or none, none of that stuff, right? 
And if I went ahead and I hit play on this, it's not going to do anything because there's nothing to build, right? It, well, it's trying. What's it creating? <laughs> nothing, right? It's just launching Chrome is all, all it did for me. So I'm going to go ahead and stop that. And then I'm going to close this project. I'm just going to say close solution. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I'm going to go back to that new project again. And this time I'm going to select the second option, which is the ASP.NET Web Forms site. And this is just more to demonstrate the tool to you. And those of you in the .NET class, or soon to take, will experience this. And we did this the other night in class. And if you've never experienced this before, it, it, it's kind of like a little bit of an eye-opener because really what's happening here is in, instead of choosing an empty one or a blank one, we're choosing one that has a basic structure already created. You see that even the launching of it is taking a little bit longer. And once that process completes, oh my god, look at all the folders it just created. I didn't do any of that. Not only did it make the folders, but I can hit this play button up here. I didn't do anything, right? All I did is new project, OK. I hit the play button. And now it's going to be launching Chrome in the background. And I can tell because it says Google Chrome right here on the play button. And we're patiently waiting. And then to explain what's happening within the product right now, Visual Studio has built into it development web server. So when I hit that play button, it turns on that server and launches the web page inside that server on your local machine. So, oh, that's not exciting. Oh, it says your application is starting. <laughs> I, I sure hope so. Okay, well, maybe your machines are working better than mine. You guys get a full-blown web page up on your screen? You should. I'm not sure why mine's not, but you should get a, a completely built out website. Right now I'm just assuming that it's just being really slow. Oh. How do you like that? It timed out. All right. Well, oh, I know why that is. I'm going to close the browser. Actually, I'm going to close. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to lose my students online. Let me do that one more time. I'm, I'm going to launch it in Firefox. Maybe it was just a, a Chrome issue. It should work in any browser, but I'm going to launch Firefox. And this looks a little more promising because you can see the debugging tools are actively running. And then if it works correctly, you will see a completely built out website or at least a framework for one once it loads up. Whenever you run the internal development server the first time when you're working, it always is slow. The initial launch is the slowest. But once that, that bootstraps into memory, the subsequent launches will be quick. So is anybody anybody else's taking as long as mine's taking? It should have been like yeah, it should have been a lot faster. I'm suspecting I might do a reboot when we take our break. There we go. Okay. So what's neat about this is the CSS is already there. There's JavaScript already there. They built out menus for us. There's a complete look involved. And yes, a lot of developers use these types of shortcuts to get their work accelerated. It's not cheating. It's using the tools that are available. All right, folks. We're going to uh, end this video here and take a break. I'm going to call Chapter 1 done, and uh, we'll move on to Chapter 2.